Welcome to the Love and Light Live podcast, empowering crystal lovers to learn and experience the art of crystal healing. Get ready to listen in and follow your soul calling with crystals. Hello, and thank you so much for joining me for the Love and Light Live podcast brought to you by loveandlightschool.com. I'm your host, Ashley Levy, and this podcast is the number one place for all things crystals. In today's show, we're going to explore the healing properties of cinnabar, which is a really interesting mineral with a long history connected to prosperity and abundance. But before we get started, I'd like to answer one of our listener questions. Remember, you could submit your own questions anytime at loveandlightschool.com slash ask for the chance to have your question answered right here on the show. Today's question comes from Samantha and Samantha asks, I like to use the full moon to charge my crystals, but unfortunately I live in an apartment and my balcony doesn't get direct light from the moon. If I leave them out, will they absorb the energy from the moon? Also, how important is it to take crystals inside the day after the full moon? Would leaving them out longer affect the energy or the charge? So Samantha, this is such a great question. Um, A lot of people have questions about this, right? When it comes to working with lunar energy in general, especially with charging your crystals. So some people use lunar light for cleansing. Some people use it for charging. Um... I have really changed my tune, so to speak, about uh, cleansing and charging with Moonlight. I used to use Moonlight for cleansing, um, but really over time I felt like it's more of, you know, the, more of a technique for charging than it is for cleansing. And here's the thing, a lot of us get hung up on this idea of using only the full moon energy to charge our crystals, but I think that's because most people, and myself included, you know, before, um, think of charging your crystals almost like charging your phone, right? Like replenishing a battery. I have really changed my mind about this, and I no longer think that crystals need to be charged this way because... I don't personally think their energy gets depleted. I think it can get kind of cluttered up with outside energies, right? And that's why cleansing is important. Um, But I don't think that we're taking energy from a crystal or that crystal energy changes that way. Now, it's maybe an unpopular opinion. It's just based on my experience and when I really started questioning, you know, well, why do we do these things that we do with crystals? Because when I first learned about charging, it was very much like, okay, after you work with your crystals, it depletes their energy. They need to be recharged, rejuvenated, um, like we do. And, you know, for a long time, I guess that kind of made sense to me. I went along with it. But after working with crystals for so, so many years, I'm just, I'm not convinced that's a thing that actually happens. I think one of the beautiful things about crystals is that their energy is relatively constant. And so instead I do still do charging, but I think about it really differently. I think of charging as more like adding another layer of a specific energy that I want to work with. So I sometimes charge my crystals with the energy of a special flower or plant or herb. I sometimes charge my crystals with the energy of a particular lunar phase. So not just the full moon, but any of the phases in the moon, depending on my intention and what I'm working with that crystal for. So to answer your question, Samantha, um, if you're charging your crystals, it does not necessarily mean that when working with moonlight that you need to have it in direct light, right? So if you have it in a window and they don't get direct light, that's okay because that lunar phase is still present. The energy of that particular moon or that monthly moon, um, whatever the specific energy is that you're wanting to kind of bring into your crystals, that is still present regardless of if they're in the direct light or not. And I mean, for them to truly, truly be in the direct moonlight, they would probably have to be outside anyway. Um, 
So I just, yeah, I don't think that's necessarily something that's important. And I've kind of always said that, even when it came to cleansing or charging, direct light isn't necessary because it's not always possible, right? Before Zach and I moved into the house that we live in now, we lived in a 600 square foot apartment for a really long time, like four or five years with two big dogs and in an apartment that was really close together with other apartments. So I don't think there was a single window in our whole space that actually got direct sun or moonlight. So that wouldn't have been possible. And then I know, you know, when you're living in an apartment, it's uncomfortable (laughs) to want to um, take your crystals outside and kind of have your neighbors <laughs> wondering what the heck you're doing. And, you know, also just leaving things outside overnight, you have to worry like, will someone take them or will something happen to them? So no, I don't think that the direct light is important. I think what's most important, like with anything, when it comes to working with crystals is your intention. Samantha has another great question and um, she asks, sometimes I find it hard to connect with my crystals. Is that a hint that I'm holding the wrong crystal or is it an issue with me and how do you recommend fixing it? Here's the thing. Sometimes we just don't connect. Maybe we're in a funky mood, right? And we're just like not fully grounded, fully present, Um, that can definitely be a contributing factor. Maybe we're feeling anxious or overwhelmed and we're just kind of struggling to stay focused. That can be a thing. Uh, And I wouldn't say that that's anything wrong with you. It just means in that moment, it's not, not the easiest thing, right? To find that connection with your crystals. Other times it could be that it's just not the right crystal for you to use at that time. So the crystal might be telling you like, Hey, you might think logically that I'm the one you should be working with right now, but actually go a little deeper, understand the root of the specific issue you're dealing with, and maybe work with a different crystal instead. Um, other times it might be that you're just not meant to work with any crystal in that moment. And that's okay too. So in order to fix this, you say, what's my recommendation for fixing it? I would say the first thing that you always want to try is to get yourself grounded and centered. Do a little grounding meditation, walk around outside for a few minutes if you're able, do a little deep breathing, drink some water, have a yummy snack, just something to really get into your body and get kind of focused and try again. And you'll find probably most of the time you'll be able to connect at that point because it's usually, at least I find from personal experience um, and from talking with my students, it's usually that just when we first tried, you know, connecting with the crystal, we had other stuff going on. So give yourself like just a little space, a little step back to get yourself grounded and focused and present and then try again. And if you're still not feeling a connection at that point, come back to that crystal in a few days time, or maybe try working with something else, but there's totally nothing wrong with you. Totally nothing wrong with the stone. Sometimes we just don't connect and that's okay. And Samantha, you said you're also interested in learning about crystals for divination. And I want to share a few resources with you about that because it is one of my favorite topics, something I find super exciting and interesting. So if you head over to the website at loveandlightschool.com slash blog, you'll see um, on the right hand side, there is... um, like a list of recent posts. And then below that, you'll see some categories. If you scroll down, you can actually find a category called divination and readings. So if you click on that, it will pull up all of the divination themed blogs. And so just last week, I released the 10 best crystals for tarot and oracle card readings, which was actually an update of an older post that I had written. I expanded upon it a little bit more and I shared a free sample from one of my classes. So I shared um, a mini class. It's about 35 minutes long. It's a little mini video course about the 10 best crystals for tarot card and oracle card readings. And I talk about these crystals, why each of them is Um, really helpful and useful for working with if you're doing cardamancy. And then that is actually part of my working with crystals in the tarot masterclass. So if you're interested in tarot specific divination, you might also want to check out that full course. You can find information about it right there in that blog post. 
There's also a great interview called Card Reading from the Heart, an interview with Dana Whitby, um, who has really become a friend and she is the host of the Soul Rising podcast. So if you like listening to good podcasts, definitely check out Dana's show as well. You'll also find a crystal elixir recipe for shadow work and how to use it for scrying divination. So this actually uses water basin scrying, but instead of just using plain water, there's a little twist and it uses a crystal elixir. So a really fun way to incorporate crystals that way. Um, There's also a great post called using crystals to learn about the tarot minor arcana and there's a partner post called working with crystals and the major arcana of the tarot so i definitely recommend checking these two out if you're interested in tarot as well Um, i break down some of the most complicated things about working with tarot cards so if they you know intimidate you a little bit like they definitely did with me when i first started working with them a few years ago i would say definitely give these two posts Um, a thorough read through because there's some great info in there. In this category on the blog, you'll also find an interview with the amazing Ethany. um, And this interview is called Tarot and the Moon. And so Ethany is talking about um, combining tarot with the phases of the moon, which Samantha, I think you'll really enjoy since it seems you're already working with the moon and you're interested in divination. So definitely give this interview a listen or a read through on the blog. You'll also find a post called how and why to use crystal oracle cards plus the best crystals for card readings. Um, So this talks a little bit about how simple oracle cards really are to use for divination. You'll also find an interview with Bridget Esselman of Biddy Tarot called The Best Crystals to Use During a Tarot Card Reading, and she has a little bit different list of crystals um, than I suggested in my post, but her recommendations are fantastic. Then... At the bottom of that category search, you'll probably need to click the older posts button because I have a ton of posts on this topic because I just love, love, love working with crystals and divination. But once you click that older posts button, you'll see some other interesting topics. So there's a blog post called Using Crystal Pendulums, Dowsing for Wisdom and Energy Reading. This is a great post on some basics of working with your pendulums. There's also a pulse called Lithomancy, Casting Stones to Read the Future. And so this is all about the art of divining with stone casting. And so um, this is definitely one you'll want to take a look at. And then there's another post called How to Perform a Crystal Ball Reading Step by step. And this is a great one all about crystal omency or scrying divination using a crystal ball. And then there are a couple other posts in there about working with pendulums, again, in some um, different perspectives, along with some tips for beginners and a few other posts about crystal divination. So I hope that will help kind of get you started on the right track. And if that's something that you want to explore more in depth, it's something that we cover really deeply in my crystal healing certification program. And you can learn more about that at crystalhealerschool.com. And finally, Samantha says, I live in Madison and I love your store. My favorite thing to get are the little mystery stones where you get a stone wrapped in tissue with a little fortune and paper about the stone. Do you sell those on your website? You know what, Samantha? Honestly, it kind of slipped my mind to add those to the website. It's one of those fun things that we've had in the store for years now. Um, but I think I'm going to talk to Lydia, the manager over at Mimosa and see if we can get those added really soon because they are really a lot of fun. So Samantha, again, thank you so much for your awesome questions. I really appreciate it. And remember, if you have a question that you'd like for me to answer for you about crystals, spirituality, or anything else you're curious about right now, let me know over at loveandlightschool.com slash ask. The Crystal Healing Certification Program is coming soon. Want to know more? For info, free training, and to get on the list, go to crystalhealerschool.com.
Now it's time to dive into our main topic for today, the healing properties of cinnabar. So cinnabar is a really vibrant red trigonal crystal that often appears on a matrix of calcite or dolomite or quartz or opal. And this has led to a little bit of confusion about what to actually call this stone, especially when it's in the tumbled variety, where there's kind of a white matrix with little red flecks in it. Sometimes you'll see it listed as cinnabar and quartz, or sometimes cinnabar and opal, or sometimes cinnabar and dolomite. Sometimes you'll just see it called cinnabarite. And so it really depends on the locality or origin of this stone, what the likely associated host rock or parent material actually is. But before I get too far into that, as you know, I always like to start these healing properties episodes with an affirmation for working with the stone. And here's the affirmation for cinnabar. I open myself to the universe's natural flow of prosperity and abundance. So let's get right into these properties of cinnabar. It's been known to stimulate vitality, providing a little boost in energy. It has a long history of aiding and manifesting prosperity and abundance, and it also helps you reap the rewards of careful planning. I think so often we think of um, kind of calling in or collecting on our hard work without necessarily giving enough credit to our ability to carefully plan. So this is really about um, kind of collecting that harvest, harvesting that abundance that comes from putting in the time to carefully plan and think ahead about the future, not necessarily from hard work. It also increases motivation, gets you really excited about things that you're working on or doing in your life. It has been said to promote beauty, both inner and outer beauty. It's also said that it can really enhance the energy of your environment or your sacred space just by having a peace within that space really um, shifts things up. And I think this is because of this connection with like vitality and motivation. It really shakes things up. So my guess is the reason it works so well for this is it keeps things from feeling stagnant. It also opens up and protects your grounding energy center, and it's said to help you spice up your love life by promoting passion. But I really think this passion extends further than just romantic passion. I think um, it has to do, again, with that zest for life, that passion for life. Now, I mentioned before, cinnabar is this really bright um, crimson red. Sometimes it goes into kind of a dark reddish black, and it's often found on a matrix of white or off-white appearing as little red flecks in tumbled stones. And like I mentioned, that matrix can really vary. It could be calcite, dolomite, quartz, opal, a myriad of other things. It's associated with the root or base energy center, the first energy center, and the zodiac signs of Aries and Leo. It's connected with the elements of fire and earth, and a great companion flower for cinnabar is clematis. Its companion essential oil is spicy, fragrant clove, and its companion stone is shatakite. This is an awesome crystal if you've never worked with it. Cinnabar is commonly found in China and in Germany, and as I mentioned earlier, it's also sometimes known as cinnabarite. Now, one important thing to know is that this stone is toxic. It's mercury sulfide, so it is important to wash your hands after handling it and not touch your mouth or your eyes while you've been handling it. This crystal does have some interesting history and lore associated with it as well. So cinnabar has been used since ancient times to create the pigment known as vermilion. Perhaps you've heard of vermilion. This mineral was ground to create that bright orange-red color that has been used for coloring and painting cave walls, uh, buildings, ceramics, and art objects, really so much more. It was used ceremonially in China as far back as 4000 BC, but it's been used as a pigment since Neolithic times um, in modern day Turkey. It was also used to adorn and decorate burial chambers and funerary objects in both China and in Peru, going back 
thousands of years. Now, the red finish that's actually still seen on many Chinese art pieces is called cinnabar, referring to the red lacquer finish that's traditionally made from this stone that's been applied to these pieces. Most modern pieces of cinnabar are, are made without the use of the actual vermilion pigment. They're just made to look similar. Um, but from my research, it seems like there may still be some modern use of this toxic mineral that still occurs. But I, I read some conflicting things. So some sources say that as long as the vermilion pigment is captured within the lacquer itself, that keeps it from being dangerous unless the object were to be discarded or destroyed in a way that would be unsafe. Now, something interesting also about this stone is that both Theophrastus and Pliny the Elder discussed a method for extracting the mercury from cinnabar rocks in some of the earliest known written works on stones. And though this stone has long been used, right, we talked about um, its use in decorating art objects and cave walls and buildings, it also has a history of very unsafe use in cosmetics, its toxicity does require some caution in its handling. Um, now, some sources claim it's safe to handle as long as the mineral isn't vaporized or breathed in as dust, but I always say using caution is recommended. So wash your hands really thoroughly after you handle this stone. And I was talking with my colleague, Nicholas Pearson, about this earlier today, and he also recommended not storing this crystal in sunlight, which I thought was great advice. So wanted to pass that along. Thank you, Nicholas. Now, cinnabar is still mined today as an ore of mercury for its use in creating things like thermometers and fluorescent light bulbs. So there's just this long use of this mineral in human history um, for everything from day-to-day -day objects to very specialized ritual and ceremonial use. Well, that is it for our main topic for today. I hope this introduced you to some interesting things about cinnabar that you didn't know until now. Do you feel intuitively called to work more deeply with your stones? To grow your confidence, knowledge, and connection to crystal energy beyond what you can learn on your own? Our award-winning Crystal Healing Certification Program will take you from crystal lover to a confident, certified crystal healer and help you discover your soul's path and crystal purpose. Maybe you want to deepen your personal spiritual practice by connecting more deeply to your stones. Or maybe you're already working with crystals, but you want to learn some more advanced energy healing techniques. Wherever you're at on your crystal journey, the Love & Light School's CCH program can help you become the confident and intuitive crystal healer you know you can be. Are you ready to listen to the nudges from the universe and take the next steps on your crystal journey? Our CCH program is here to support you every step of the way. And now it's time for our trending this week segment. As you know, each week I bring you a quick discussion on something that's happening in the world of crystal healing and spirituality right now, or something that I'm just loving that I want to share. And, um, with our last full moon, something that's really been on my mind a lot is a lot of talk about lunar eclipses. And had I known how much discussion there was going to be around this most recent lunar eclipse, I definitely would have added this to last week's segment. So it would have come out before the full moon with the eclipse. Um, but my hope is at least you'll hear this now and be able to call back on this information next time we have an eclipse, which really won't be that far away. So we have another lunar eclipse happening November 19th for the reed or beaver or snow moon that will be in Taurus. So November 19th is our next upcoming lunar eclipse. So a lot of people have been saying, you know, don't do any work with your crystals during eclipse. Don't do any magical work, any manifesting work, any um, intention setting, any, anything. <laughs> I mean, people are saying, you know, basically just lay low. 
during a lunar eclipse. And I have some mixed feelings about this. I think just like anything, and this kind of harkens back to what I was talking about earlier, um, answering Samantha's question at the start of the show about crystal charging. It's really a lot like that. It's about our intention. How do we want to work with that energy? And why do we want to work with that energy? I think we need to be specific and understand what it is that we're doing. And, um, you know, I think it's perfectly fine to charge your crystals, make your moon water, do your ritual or ceremony, do your meditation, your manifesting work, your divination, whatever you're doing, it's still fine during a lunar eclipse, as long as you understand the energy that that eclipse is carrying. And there are so many layers to this because it's not just about the eclipse itself, right? It's also about the phase of the moon that the moon is in. So we always, if we have a full lunar eclipse, the moon has to be full because that's how the alignment between the moon and the earth and the sun works to get that lunar eclipse. So it always happens during a full moon. It's about the specific monthly moon, the energies of that monthly moon. It's about what else might be happening astrologically. It's about the season that we're in. And kind of taking all of that into consideration. And so if you're going to do any kind of work, charging your crystals or making moon water or whatever you're doing, it's really about thinking about how all of those energies are playing into one another and making sure that's an energy that you want to work with, that you want to call in. And so that's really the most important thing is just being intentional and having some awareness about what's going on when you're working with those energies. Now, in general, I tend to think of eclipses as a great time for shadow work and introspection, really doing some deep dive work. And this does, I guess, more or less kind of play into this idea of laying low a little bit, um, not doing any work that's more external, but instead focusing on the internal realm. And, you know, for me, that's just what an eclipse is about. But again, taking into consideration these other energies, these other things that are going on and maybe allowing that to provide a little direction on, okay, like what part of me needs to be looked at? Where should I focus my shadow work based on what is um, kind of having a light shined on it at that time? And so I hope that's helpful as we move to the time of our next lunar eclipse in November. And had I realized it was going to be such a controversy and such a big topic of importance, I definitely, like I said, would have brought it up um, last week. So you would have had the information in time, but I hope that you'll be able to kind of take this to heart. I hope that makes sense. And the bottom line is, you know, always think about like what you feel comfortable with, what makes sense to you. Um, you know, there's nothing wrong with going to other sources and kind of confirming what else is out there and what other people are doing. I think that can, really help inform us and provide some important information. But when people use like blanket statements, like never do this or always do this, I always tend to question that a little bit more. So I hope that's helpful. Well, that is it for today. I hope that you found a lot of value in today's show. And if you want more information about anything I discussed in this episode, you can learn more over on the website at loveandlightschool.com slash blog. And if you did enjoy the show today, of course, the biggest compliment you can give me is to leave a quick rating and a review over at loveandlightschool.com slash iTunes. Every time I get another review, I get so, so excited. I love reading these and it does help others learn a little bit more about the show, about what it's like and see if it's a good fit for them. So I really appreciate all of you who've been leaving reviews and I want to give a big shout out today to Fashionator101 who left a five-star review and says, a joy to listen to. I've been enjoying listening to Ashley. She shares wonderful information that I've found to be inspirational. I'm so excited to listen to more episodes. So thank you so, so much. I am so grateful for 
you taking the time to leave that rating and that review. It really means a lot to me. And if you want to make sure that you catch all the future episodes of the show, head over to loveandlightschool.com slash listen. You can find all the places to subscribe to the podcast so that you never miss a future episode. And you can also see some highlights of our most popular episodes and all the recent episodes that we have for you to listen to. So definitely, you know, if you are finding yourself with some extra time, you want to have a little bit of discussion and chatter about crystals going on in the background while you're working on projects or driving or working out or whatever you're doing, um, I'd be super grateful if you listened to a few episodes. So definitely go ahead and feel free to check out some of those past episodes as well. Well, that brings us to the end of this episode of the Love and Light Live podcast. I'm your host, Ashley Levy, and I'll be back with you in our next episode. Until then, crystal blessings. The Love and Light Live podcast is a production of the Love and Light School of Crystal Therapy. Connect with us online at loveandlightschool.com or on social at Love and Light School. The content provided on or through our website or podcast makes no claims for specific or general health or health results and should not be used to examine, diagnose, or treat any medical condition prescribe medications, make claims for specific or general healing or health results, or as a substitute for traditional medical treatment. For medical advice, you should consult a licensed healthcare specialist. For more information, please refer to the terms of use on our website at loveandlightschool.com.